Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The serpent could barely contain his glee. It took every ounce of his self-control to maintain his gentle, friendly face as he watched the woman turn the fruit around in her hand. It honestly surprised him how easy it had been. Humanity was supposed to be God's greatest creation, made in his own image. Yet it had taken only a scant few sentences to turn them away toward their own desires. The woman studied the fruit. It looked just like any of the other fruits that grew on the trees of the garden. Yet she had been told that this fruit was forbidden. This fruit would lead to death. But the serpent says it's not so, she thought. He says that I will not die if I eat it. He says that this fruit will make us like God. Could that be true? Was God hiding something from them? Did he give this commandment not because he wanted the best for her and her husband, but because he wanted to control them? She glanced at her husband, eyeing the fruit with the same curious glances. She looked about. She saw God nowhere. The serpent's words came back to her. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God. She took a breath, steeled herself, and lifted the fruit to her mouth. It was sweet, like any other fruit. She chewed, waiting for death to seize her, yet it never came. Finally, she swallowed the fruit. She didn't feel any different. It seemed the serpent had told the truth. The woman looked to the man again. He glanced at her, then down at the bite mark in the fruit. He reached out to take it from her hand. He too took a bite, chewed, and swallowed. Then the two felt something new. Shame. Shame at their own nakedness. Shame at the feeling of total exposure. They heard the rustle of leaves and the shifting of grass. They heard the gentle, even tapping of feet against the ground. And the man whispered hoarsely, God is coming. The half-eaten fruit fell from the man's fingers, and the woman stared wide-eyed at her hand, still stained with nectar from the forbidden fruit. And again, there was a new feeling. Fear. A grin finally slithered onto the serpent's face. As the man and the woman rushed to cover their bodies with hastily gathered leaves, the serpent remembered his own words. Did God really say? You would have to remember that phrase. It had worked so well. As we prepare to celebrate our Lord's passion and crucifixion, we begin by remembering why it was necessary in the first place. The devil approached Adam and Eve in the garden, seeking their ruin. The goal was ultimately to create a rift between God and man, to separate the Creator from his creation. To that end, the devil employed his greatest weapons, temptation and doubt. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was, to all appearances, good for food, pleasing to behold, and desirable to make one wise. Eve, calculating the supposed benefits of this fruit, and believing them to be of greater value than God's word, ate of that which God had forbidden. And Adam, standing there with her, joined her in disregarding God's decree. By this act of rebellion, sin is born, and death comes to all. But we don't recount this history so that we can blame Adam and Eve for all of our problems. We have all faced temptation. 
and we have all chosen to indulge it. Temptations are sure to come, seeking to pull us away from God, from His Word, and from obedience to His commandments. And they come in many forms. The desire to be well supplied with money tempts us to prioritize amassing our own wealth rather than heeding what God says about charity and giving. The allure of absolute independence tempts us to prioritize our own wants even when what we want is something that God has forbidden. These are just a few, but many more temptations might be mentioned. But when temptation and sin come, that same question that the serpent asked of Eve often comes to the forefront. Did God really say? But let's be frank. The problem isn't that we genuinely don't know what God has said on a particular subject. It's that we do know what he has said, but we need some way around it. We know that following God's commandments means giving up things that we want and we enjoy. So the devil's question is asked, not by the devil himself, but by our own hearts, in an attempt to justify what we have already set out to do. We are more concerned with our own desires than the will of God, but we act as though it were God's fault, as though God had not been clear. But God is not moved by such a feeble defense. God's command to Adam and Eve had been clear, Do not eat the fruit of this tree! And he has given his commandments to us with the same clarity. Did God really say? Yes, God really said. We simply choose to ignore it. We choose to sin. We choose to rebel. And God will require an answer for each and every act of rebellion. Our rebellion has earned us shame. Shame for all the times we were tempted and chose to indulge in the temptation, even when we had every opportunity to avoid it. We could have left the room, put down the phone, turned off the screen. We could have prayed for deliverance or hastened to God's word for strength. We could have done all of that but we cared more for our own wants, our own ambitions, our own pleasures, than we cared for what God has declared. Our rebellion has earned us fear. Fear that we will have to stand before God in all his righteous fury and confess, I have sinned against you by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. We fear that on Judgment Day, God will produce the record of every last sin that we have committed in thought, word, and deed, and that he will deal with us in exactly the manner that our sins have merited. Our rebellion has earned us death. What other punishment is fitting for our sins? What other penalty can properly match the magnitude of our crime? For rebellion against the holy king of all creation, the only proper sentence is death and damnation. Enter Jesus in the wilderness. Throughout his entire life, Jesus faced the same temptations that we face. In the particular instance seen in the Gospel reading, we see the ancient battle between the serpent and mankind replayed. Only here the situation is reversed. The devil is not coming up against a fat-fleshed humanity living in an earthly paradise. He is coming up against a man withered by weeks of fasting, languishing in the desolate wilderness. By all appearances, it would seem that the serpent has the advantage. 
So he musters his usual assortment of temptations and presses the offensive. And he is soundly defeated. With each temptation, the devil sought to turn Jesus away from trust in and reliance on his Father. Yet in each instance, Christ turns to the Word of God. His trust is always with the Father, and Christ's greatest want, his deepest desire, is for the Father's will to be done. In Christ, there is no rebellion, no shame, no fear, no death. And you are in Christ. In your baptism, Christ declared by water and the word, You are mine. What I have done, I have done for you. I have paid the penalty for your rebellion. I have borne your shame. I have taken away your fears. I have died your death. You are mine, and you live in me. Christ has promised this, and Christ never promises in vain. You are in Christ, and in Christ there is no rebellion. The record of your sins has been utterly blotted out by the blood of Jesus. The Father has ripped it into shreds and burned the pieces, so thorough and complete is his gracious pardon. The record of your deeds is this, steadfast, unflinching resolve in the face of temptation, full, unwavering trust in God above all things, and perfect, unblemished obedience to God's will. Your record is that of Christ, credited to your name by faith. You are in Christ, and in Christ there is no shame. Whatever stain or blemish on your conscience plagues you, God does not see it. You have been cleansed from every impurity and robed with the very beauty of Christ's own holiness. The scars of sin are hidden even from the eyes of the all-seeing God. The Father sees you as his own dear child. He delights in you as one dearly beloved. In his eyes, you are utterly without blemish. You are in Christ, and in Christ there is no fear. Christ has paid the debt which you owe to the Father with his own blood. There is nothing left to be paid. No further work that needs be done. No fine prints on the promises of God. He is not dangling his love in front of you, waiting for you to do something to make yourself worthy of it. His love is yours, without condition. All that remains for you to do is to receive. Receive his blessings. Receive his gifts. Receive his word and his sacraments. You are in Christ, and in Christ there is no death. Just as the Father did not abandon his beloved Son to the grave, he will not abandon you, who are his child, in baptism. Death's power is forever destroyed in Christ. The grave holds no more terror for you than the bed you arose from this morning. Death is but a moment of rest for your body before it is again raised to partake of the eternal celebration. Christ has promised this, and Christ never promises in vain. You are in Christ. And in Christ, the story which began in Eden has a new ending. The devil sought your rebellion to end in condemnation, but Christ has brought about peace. 
Christ has put an end to your rebellion and brought you back before your king, not to receive judgment, but pardon, not to be cast into hell as a lawbreaker, but to be made an heir of the kingdom of heaven, to be made a child of God, adopted by grace. Christ has promised this, and Christ never promises in vain. Amen. In the name of Jesus, amen.